If I ask you what are one of the first things you notice about me, what would you say? Probably the fact that I'm Asian. You might not be thinking it, but it's somewhere in your subconscious. And this is not uncommon. Actually, you're in the majority of people. You know, as much as people say, don't judge a book by its cover, we tend to do it anyways. Well, maybe not judge, but at least assume. You would then move on to trying to figure out what type of Asian I am. Some people ask, no, but where are you really from? I'm no geography expert myself, but luckily for you, since I'm the first Japanese person raised in America in my family, I would tell you that I'm Japanese, so no need to guess where in Asia I'm from. Now, March of last year, 2021, I had this sudden realization of my own identity. Not in a way in which you're like, oh, I'm present, I am here realization, but more of an awareness of my own cultural upbringing. Ever since I was little, I had this general to hatred towards how I looked. I hated my dark straight hair, my brown eyes, and a flat nose that set me apart from the majority of my community. I thought it was so unfair that I was not born with blonde hair or blue eyes. This feeling inside of me was introduced to me in second grade when I was first made aware that I looked different. I had moved from Japan to a small city in Chile where I was the only Asian in the entire school from about 2,000 students. I might be overestimating. I remember reading a book about dentists, and in it, there was a picture of an Asian girl, clearly not of the same ethnicity as me, as far as I could tell. This boy stood up and said, look, guys, this girl looks just like Yui. I don't particularly remember what happened after that, but I do remember crying. I had been introduced to the concept of racism without even realizing it. Some people at school referred to me as China, the Spanish word for Chinese. I didn't think of this much at the time. Obviously, I was too young to understand what racism was. I was maybe seven or eight at the time. But in the long run, I mean, 13 years from then, I can still vividly remember these instances. Because of situations like this, I spent most of my still relatively short life not associating with Asians and our culture, and trying to separate myself from stereotypes as best as I could. I've learned to ignore the very present fact that I'm Asian and some of my friends are not. But sometimes, as ridiculous as it sounds, I find myself reflecting on this fact whenever I'm trying new pairs of sunglasses at a store. I find ones that I like, but they do not have pad arms or nose pads, and they do not sit on my nose. So my options for sunglasses are cut in half. I know it's bizarre, but each time it's like a slap in the face that I'm not physically built for the Western world. Not that it is a grave issue, I just don't have as many options to fashionably cover my eyes from the sun, but it's something in my daily life that makes me kind of re-realize this constant presence of race. I became more aware of this distance between me and people of different races following the introduction of the coronavirus. One week, we were hearing about this new virus spreading through China, and in a matter of weeks, it had spread around the globe. With this spread came the terms China virus, Chinese virus, Wuhan virus, coined by the former president of the United States. These words had an adverse effect not only on the Chinese community globally, but also on the entire Asian community. This term was taken too literally by some people who turned their anger towards the pandemic into acts of violence. And I think here we see a deeper issue than the pandemic itself. The fact that the East is seen as a collective, the only country in Asia being Asia. Now, geographically, we all know this is wrong, but when brought to the political sphere, these countries and the East become blurred. I think this is where stereotypes that all Asians look the same come into play. In my opinion, we all look different, but maybe it's not the case for others. A few years back, I would have probably laughed and stayed silent, but now I'm here to say that, surprise, no, we don't all look the same. But we remain categorized, and we have felt the injustices together. Between 2019 and 2020, hate crimes towards Asian Americans increased by 150%, and in just New York, it increased by 833% from three cases to 28 cases. Yet, they often remain unnoticed by the public. 
How can the population in one city become so polarized and divided, becoming over eight times more violent? But New York is not the exception. From 2020 to 2021, Asian American hate crimes in the form of violence, verbal abuse, most commonly categorized as hate crimes, increased by 339% in the United States alone. And this number continues to increase, and it may keep increasing until the pandemic is no longer a grave concern. However, who is to say that this general feeling of unease will diminish with the end of the pandemic? This is really upsetting because we, Asians, are now associated with the virus even after two years into its spread. And this is not the first time. During World War II, Japanese Americans were put into internment camps. But I just learned last semester that globally, not a lot of people are aware of this because it is rarely discussed. To put things into context, about a th 112,000 Japanese Americans were sent to 10 different internment camps located mostly on the West Coast after being ordered to pack everything and leave their house within a 48-hour notice. Any other belongings that could not be taken to these camps along with property were seized by the authorities and never returned. I can't speak on behalf of all high schools in the US, but at mine, they didn't really go into depth about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 or the, the fact that my high school was built on top of land that was essentially seized by the government from a Japanese-American man who had been sent to an internment camp. I mean, also things like how to pay taxes and other necessary things to become a functioning adult. I don't know why they didn't teach us these things, but when my friend wrote an article about it on the school newspaper, it was like everybody was in shock. Of course, the shock did not prompt a change in our school history curriculum or anything, but I feel like there and then some sort of recognition could have been made about the fact that these two events were real occurrences in the history of the United States. During wartime, discrimination is not unheard of, but that is not to say it is acceptable in any way. But its persistence in day-to-day -day society cannot be justified. In a country composed of various ethnic and cultural backgrounds, why has this adverse reaction towards Asians remained in our society? During my research, I came across an article written by Professor Rucker Johnson at UC Berkeley, who specializes in public policy, and he said that Asian Americans are more likely to be targeted and other races are more hostile towards them when they're seen as more foreign. There's no exact definition of what foreign is, but one of the underlying traits of being foreign is language fluency. As we saw in the Atlanta spa shootings in March of 2021, Asian Americans who are not fluent in English are more targeted. And this is why we see so much resistance against Chinatowns. So not only is the Asian community being targeted for the way we look, but now for the way we sound as well. Throughout my life, I've been told several times that I have an accent when I speak. I mean, of course, English isn't my first language, but I never knew that until someone pointed it out to me. Ever since the first comment was made to me, I wonder if people see me as a foreigner in the United States. Here in Hans, especially, with such a small population of Asians, I'm not surprised if people consider me as a foreigner. But with this understanding, does it mean I'm walking around the city with a target on my back? Does my face announce to the whole world about the fact that I look different? I can't get into the brains of passerbys wondering what they think of me. However, I still have this lingering fear that one day I could be the victim of a hate crime, more than just hateful comments, but a physical attack. We're all dealing with the pandemic in different ways, and as cliche as it sounds, violence has never been and will never be the answer. Earlier in the year, Michelle Goh made headlines for being the victim of an Asian American hate crime. She was pushed onto the train tracks of an oncoming train at Times Square. She attended UCLA, business school at NYU, and was working at Deloitte. She was passionate about helping the disadvantaged. Her pictures were displayed on Times Square and all over the news, but she's not the only one. Almost every day, there's some kind of new incident about another Asian person being the victim of a hate crime that does not make it to the headlines. 
It could be an elderly person or a child. The hate that instigates the crime does not change. The reason behind the hate crime does not change. Their lives are not humanized, and the families are left to grieve their loss. When and how are we, as a modernized society, still at a point in time where hurting someone because of their race became almost normalized? Since when do I have to watch my back every time I'm walking somewhere or I am by myself fearing that I could be the next victim simply because of the way I look? I want to recall two of the many hate crime incidents that occurred. One in Seattle, where an Asian woman was walking with her partner, who was a white male, and suddenly the woman was attacked. But only the woman. See the problem here? Even if you think to yourself, oh, there's no chance that they will be a victim of a hate crime, it is still likely to happen. This incident proves that these attacks are directed towards Asians, and you may be put in a position where your race may not shield them from harm. The second incident occurred in Paris, where three individuals threw acid at a group of Asians. As soon as this news came out, I got a text from my mom telling me to be careful, to be extra cautious if I'm walking alone, and also to avoid walking at night altogether whenever I didn't need to. My mother, who is about 9,100 kilometers away from me, was sending me a text to be careful. Now, if this were about anything else, I would have barely taken into account. I love my mom, but she wasn't going to control my actions 9,100 kilometers away, you know, college. But when I saw that message, I got goosebumps. This violence had become so bad that it was not strange for my parents to specifically worry about their own daughter, who was in another country, a country where the hate crime was still not as bad as the United States, being involved in a possible hate crime. On the other hand, I feared for my parents. My parents living in a city in California. My parents, who are the sweetest people in the world. Biased, yes, but my point still stands. What kind of person would want to hurt my parents? But then again, what kind of person would want to hurt anyone just because of the way they look? This was when the fear that my parents might be involved in a hate crime really set in. After that, I took a break from reading these types of news as they become so frequent. Another Asian person harassed, assaulted, or killed. It is hard to admit, but I think in our society, there's this general unsaid understanding. Maybe not understanding, but a notion that Asian people are not good looking and they will never be as pretty as girls with blonde hair or blue eyes, the Western ideal of what a woman should look like. Not that I was trying to get attention from everyone at school, but I stood out from the crowd and not in a good way. I went to high school, which was majority white or half Asian, half white kids. So it was quite easy to abandon my Japanese culture that my parents worked so hard for me to keep. They sent me to Japanese school, which I unfortunately hated. We had an additional day of school on Saturday, but taught in Japanese at a local high school. I mean, who wants another extra day of school? Even there, my class was always sort of left out from the other crowd because of the fact that we spoke more English than Japanese. The others knew who they were, Japanese, but for me, it was a difficult and quite different question. When I go to Japan to visit my family, a lot of people talk to me in English and stare at me because I'm taller than the average height in Japan. When I go to Chile or the US or even here in France, obviously I don't look like any of these nationalities, so I end up being confused about where I belong. This feeling is strengthened by the fact that there is very little representation of Asians in the media. Little girls looked up to Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, or Snow White. But what about me? Mulan? And what else? From Asian models to actresses, one of the few times when Asians were recognized was when Crazy Rich Asians and Squid Game became so successful, which as they should have, but it further proved that Asians were not commonly represented in society. On the other hand, there is an underlying issue of fetishization of the Asian community. Film scholar Celine Shimizu stated that the misrepresentation of Asian women as vessels of excessive sexuality has dehumanized this population. A more common example is when people say, you're pretty for an Asian. So, I can't just be pretty? 
Depictions of us in pop culture and media is misleading, and as much as people like anime, it is obviously not an accurate representation of us as people. Along with this, stereotypes has also become significantly harmful in today's context. The fact that we eat smelly food, we're all good at math, or we can't drive. It seems harmless, but there is a deep-rooted conflict of racism behind all these assumptions, and it perpetuates racist comments. As model minorities, a minority that is perceived as achieving a higher degree of socioeconomic success than others, Asians have been expected to stay quiet. When something happens, we don't report it. We stay silent out of the fear that speaking out would only worsen the situation. Culturally, we were never taught to be loud. Instead, to keep our heads down and to be quiet. But as the thoughts and worries in my head become louder and louder, the only thing I can do is to speak up. Even if my friends have heard me talk about this a million times, I still speak up. I speak up with the hopes that one day my voice will allow for Asian kids to not be scared or embarrassed by the way they look, and their parents won't worry that their child will be involved in a hate crime. I'm sure, especially now, every now and then you hear different stories of Asians speaking out, voicing their concerns and opinions, and sometimes they all start sounding the same. Murders, assaults, hate crimes, and death threats on Asian restaurants to go back home. Now, this is not to tell you to stop listening to me, but I want to tell you my own story. When people post pictures on social media, it becomes easily misinter misinterpreted because there's no voice behind the picture to guide you through the author's point of view. The author doesn't know how people are listening to them, and I understand because talking about this is not easy. It gets me emotional in a way that I'm slowly learning how to handle. I didn't choose to be born of a certain race or ethnicity, and especially when you're young, you don't really give much thought about how you look, or that you might look different from others, until that concept of being different is suddenly introduced to you. For those of you hurting, I'm there with you. For those of you fighting, I'm there with you. And for those of you who try to understand us, thank you.